Gracias, Señor. Good morning, church. How are you all? You okay? What a lovely day to praise our God. Amen. Would you like to stand with us? Lewis is going to lead us in the first song. I put my faith in Jesus 
Cause he has never let me down He's faithful through generations So why would he fail? Cause he won't So got joy in chaos I've got peace that makes no sense So I won't be going under I'm not held by my own strength Cause I built my life on Jesus He'll never let me down Faithful through every season so why would he fail back? He won't. He won't. Cause he won't fail. He won't fail. He won't. He won't. He won't, he won't fail.
I just want to speak the name of Jesus And over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus Cause I just want to speak the name of Jesus Every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is Pat Your name is power Your name is healing Your name
Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. From the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family. After night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet, yet their voice goes out into all the earth. 
their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. Last week, most of us saw on TV the eclipse. And what dropped in my spirit when I saw that was that the heavens are declaring the glory of God. They don't have no words or no speech, but they're telling us that there is a God. There is a God in heaven. There is a God who created this earth. It doesn't matter what anyone has said about evolution, about Big Bang. When we see that amazing sight, it tells us without words that God is real. And God is right here today. I don't know what you have come with. I don't know what you are facing. But I want to say to you that I speak Jesus. His name is power. His name is healing. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Can we sing that again? Just a little bit. Yeah, thank you. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Good morning, church. Good morning, those online. You can take your seat. <clears throat> so I just want to tell you that there's a lot happening in church. So after this second service, there's going to be a meeting, a gathering, a fellowship of all um, university students, professionals, so if you're one of them, then stay after so that you can get connected. Um, also this evening, for anyone who works in schools, please um, reach out to Paul Harmon. There is a, a meeting for anyone who is involved in schools. And then I want to say to you that tomorrow, every Monday, we have prayer meeting. If you've never been to prayer meeting, then this is your personal invitation to attend tomorrow from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock. In the life of the church, prayer is very important. It's the powerhouse. 
And you might be someone that prays at home or you pray by yourself, but I want to encourage you to come and join us as a church and pray. So I'm hoping to see you tomorrow from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock. And then for everyone that's around on a Friday, there is what we call Friendship Friday. It's not just for me, it's not just for Cheryl, but it's for everyone. And this particular Friday, the Citizens Advice Bureau and Immigration are going to be joining us. So if you're free and you're available, please come at 10.30 this Friday. Looking forward to see you all there. And now, just before um, we take the offering, I just want to read a scripture. So in... So in Mark 12, from verse 41, it says, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, truly I say, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. Now, the church is a charity, so therefore, God calls us to give, to bless the church. But this morning, I'm speaking to those who are members and those who are regular attenders. And I want to say to you that if you haven't signed up for gift aid, then this is your opportunity to sign up for gift aid. What is gift aid? In short, it is a means by which the government or the tax office would give 25% back to everything that you give. So for example, if you are like the widow who could only give a few cents, if you could only give a pound today, then the tax office would give 25p for every pound that you give, so 25%. So at the front here, there are um, more information that you can grab, or you can speak to Ian at the back. Ian, maybe you can raise your hand up. <laughs> you can speak to Ian, and he can give you more information. But you have come, you may have come today, and you might be saying, I only go a few pounds. And as much as I'm speaking to regular attenders and to members, who am I to stop you if today is your first time and God has laid on your heart to give something? Not me. I'm not going to stop you. So feel free to give online. There are three methods that you can give. It's on the screen behind me. Or when the bucket comes by, you can put what God has laid on your heart. Can we stand as I pray, please?
Father God, I just thank you for what you have laid upon our hearts, oh God, to give to your church. Father God, I ask, oh God, Lord, that you will bless the offering, that you will open doors for each and every person, Lord, as they give, Lord. Because somebody might be like the widow, giving out of their poverty. And today, Lord, I ask that you will bless them because of their willingness and their generosity. I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.
Sing our own little songs up around the way. Let's just stay in that attitude just for a few more seconds. If you're comfortable, put out your arms like this. We're singing about throwing up our hands, putting our hands out. And this signifies so much. Putting your hands out, it's an act of celebration, isn't it? See it in football stadiums all across the country. I want to see it a bit more in Luton, but we see it across the country. You also see it's a sign of surrender. You're saying, I'm not a threat, there's nothing here. It's also a sign of giving. It's giving up, giving something. But it's also a sign of receiving. So Lord Jesus, we stand here with arms up, arms out, hands open, hearts open, Lord Jesus. Anything we need to just leave here today, Father, at your throne, Lord Jesus, we just drop it down. And Lord, as we stand here with empty hands, we pray, Lord, that anything you want to give us you want to speak to us anything we need to receive from you Father we take up what you offer Lord Jesus we pray this in your name Amen Amen why you turn say hello to someone welcome them into church today welcome of course to everyone online as well Fantastic. Well, it's great to see you this morning. We are carrying on our generous campaign that we kicked off last week. If you missed last week, don't worry at all. This will be a standalone message. But we are taking some time as a church to look around what it means to be generous. Now, when we think of generosity, obviously the first thing we think of is finances. And I'm aware we're in the UK. 
Uh, there's a British mentality in the UK, but we're in a very multicultural and African church. What I love about African people, they're not shy talking about money. You talk to British people, they go bright red and don't know what to do with themselves. <laughs> they're like checking their pockets, like, I'm not going to be robbed. Oh, why, why do you want to know that? Why, why are we talking about money? African people, they're so free. Goodness me, we can learn something from the Africans, can't we? And the South Americans, yeah. just so open talking about finances, and, and it's not just finances, it's about personal things as well. You know exactly how an African person's feeling as soon as you walk up to them. <laughs> British people, you have to do a bit of prodding and some digging, so it's fantastic, isn't it, being a part of such a multicultural church, and, and I'm British on the outside, but my stomach is African, so if you want to bless me any time, <laughs> you, can, you can give me some African food. You know, Thalma's here. Thalma will often turn up to church with a huge bag of jollof rice, chicken, plantain. So don't even worry about your money. Just bring food. That's, that's even better. Anyway, generous. Generous. Wendy kicked off our theme, Generous, last week. We asked Wendy to come. Becky and I were on holiday with the kids that week. So we just thought it'd be so fantastic for Wendy to come. Wasn't she brilliant? She had so much wisdom to share. <laughs> Wendy is... The Elim Church's answer to Stacey Solomon, okay? So she had so much to share. Next week, we're going to go really deep in the Bible. We're getting Roy Turner to come and speak on finances. Um, Roy's just going to bring such a great word. If you're ever wondering what tithing is, do we tithe Old Testament, New Testament? It's something that people go through their whole life at church. Not Do we tithe, do we not? Come next week, Roy will talk about that. Now, the problem with that, Wendy last week, Roy next week, is I'm in the middle, and I don't want to say what Wendy's already said, and I don't want to get in trouble with Roy by preempting what he's going to say. So I was thinking this week, well, where on earth do I talk on generosity? What's my angle? What's my pitch? And you know, you can so often look at the pastor or a pastor and think you're just dripping in revelation. You know, sometimes I'm worried Thursday morning, if I haven't got a word from God, I'm panicking. I'm texting the elders like, I think I'm going to be sick this weekend. <laughs> but how do you know you're going to be sick? No, I'm going to be sick this weekend. But you know, in those times, I often just go back to some of my favourite Bible sto stories, which are usually Sunday school stories. And I'm blown away again and again, reading the same thing that I've read for years, how God just speaks to me. So what I'm going to do, and whenever I preach, I, I will never say God has said this. What I will say is I believe God said it to me. So I'm going to share it with you. You weigh it. Tells us, doesn't it, in the Bible, I think, is it uh, 1 John 4, that we should test the Spirit. So weigh what I'm going to say, and hopefully, you know, God's blessed me through it, and he will bless you. So let's start with generosity. What on earth does it mean? And you think, well, obviously, I know what generosity means. I know what it means to be generous. We found out at this week's elders meeting on Monday, a certain elder, I won't um, tell you who it was, but she's married to me, a certain elder... <laughs> was around uh, the table and we're talking about several go, you know we're going to do several of this and Becky's like oh okay we'll do several seven and, and all the other elders looked at Becky and went what do you mean seven she thought well several means seven doesn't it we're like no several means two or three at most and honestly we, I'm looking at Jan we spent about 15 minutes talking about what several means so just to make sure we're all on the same page this is the dictionary definition of generosity and I think there's a typo so give me some grace okay Generosity is showing a readiness to give more of something than is strictly necessary or expected. There's a couple of typos in there, isn't there? Just making sure you're aware and awake. It's about giving more, I love that, than is necessary or expected. So what I want to talk to you about today is a, a story, an account in the Bible that I believe is so relevant for us in 21st century Luton. So if you've got a Bible, Acts 3 is where we're going. And as I always said, if you're a bit worried, it's your first time you don't have a Bible, don't worry. Just look down into your palm. No one will know any different. Okay. So if you're a left brain person, if you're um, analytical, your title is this. It's Generous Community. But if you're right brain, you're a little bit more creative and you like a bit of flair and poetry, you can put at the top of your page, because I know you're all taking notes, is beauty at the beautiful. Beauty at the beautiful. And I'm going to read the first 10 verses and then I'm going to split it up into two. Okay, I'm reading all the way to verse 10 just to give you context of what's happening, but we'll end up landing in verse 7. Is everyone with me? Yes. Fantastic. Jen and Cheryl are. The rest of you, just close your eyes, pretend you're praying, but I know you're sleeping, okay? So verse 1, Acts 3. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, and it was three in the afternoon. 
Now a man, pay attention to this, who was lame from birth, was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. And Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. And there's an exclamation mark. So I think the man thought he might be receiving a punch rather than money. Look at us, he said, exclamation mark in my Bible. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And I love that. There's no exclamation mark there. It's just a full stop. I think that shows a certainty and a confidence in Peter's uh, statement there. Verse 7. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped up to his feet and began to walk, and then he went off with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognised him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Beauty at the beautiful. I want to start by simply saying this, and this will sum up my whole message. So if you don't hear anything else, listen to this. We serve a generous God. We serve a very generous God. And he exceeds our expectations, he exceeds our limitations, and I want to tell you today, our God who loves us and likes us wants to see his generosity in our lives. So as I said, as I was looking at this story, a really familiar one for me, I sort of almost skip over some of the verses to get to the exciting bit. Do you ever do that in the Bible? Yeah, okay, two of us, that's okay. The rest of you are liars and that'll be pulled up on Judgment Day. Anyway, okay. (laughs) And you know, we we know it, don't we? We go through the motions. But what I saw this time, I I absolutely loved. You see, the first two verses is what I want to concentrate on. And we can see this as like the preamble. It's set in the context and the scene, waiting for the big thing, the finale to happen. But actually, we can learn so much just from the first two verses. And there's one word that stood out to me, and it was this, or two words. I spell it as one word. Every day. Every day. Now, this straight away tells me a little bit about this man. It tells me he has a very, very good support network around him. He's been lame from birth. It means he's never walked, never be able to, ha- to get around, probably needs help in the kitchen at home, getting dressed. But every single day, he had people come around to his house, open the door, get him ready, get him fed, and every day, bring him to the temple. Every single day, sitting right at the gate. And in our haste sometimes to get to some of the exciting things that happen in the Bible, we want to see the miracles, we want to see the supernatural, we miss the miracles of the ordinary. There is so much power in persistence and orderliness. Showing up every single day for a friend, for a loved one, can be a miracle to them. And we so often miss this, some of the understated stuff. We look for the glory and the bangs and the noise and the goosebumps and the shivers, but sometimes God just works in the ordinary. And I think we don't know who this man's friends were, who his network were, who his family were, but we can learn so much from them. And Paul himself, in a letter to the church in Galatia, said this, said to the church, what you should be doing is carrying each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Well, what's the law of Christ? What's the law of Christ? Well, I think if we do a bit of detective work, we deduce it, we're talking about what was important to Jesus. What was the most important thing that Jesus said? And in one instance in Matthew 22, 36 to 40, a man came up to Jesus and he said, teacher, please tell us what is the most important thing that we need to learn. If we are to follow God in the way you tell us to follow God, what should we do? And Jesus said this. He said, number one, love the Lord your God. And number two, love your neighbour as yourself. Fantastic. That's a fast track in heaven when you get to the pearly gates. Love God and love people. Isn't that so powerful? Now, what I love about this story is there's so much we can, if we do a bit of a deep dive, and I always take preacher's liberty, put myself in this story, look at what's happening. There's so much we can learn from these friends. 
You see, this man being lame from birth, he never would have been allowed to go into the temple. Because he had a disability, thank goodness we moved away from this, he wasn't allowed into the church. He could only get to the gate. But I love what the friends did. And yes, they put him there to help sustain him and to get money, but they took him as far as they possibly could to the threshold of God's presence. And here's the thing. Each and every one of us has people in and around our lives who haven't got to the presence of God yet. That is something we can't do for people. We can't get saved for people. We can't get healed for people. Only they can do that in the presence of God themselves. But what we can do is carry them to the threshold. We can pick people up and we can take them. We can carry their burdens and take them to the threshold of the presence of God. Well, what are people's burdens? Because as we look around, we're not all lame. We can't, we're not all uh, unable to walk. Well, what I think Paul is saying in Galatians is people who are struggling, people who are going through some stuff. And I want to tell you, one out of one of us at some point will be in a position where we're crippled in some form or another. It might not be physical, but it may be emotional or spiritual where we just can't help ourselves. And it is in those instances, it's so important that we have people around us who are able to pick us up and take us to the throne. And when we get there, when we get near the glory of God, I believe that he will come and he will find a way and he will meet us there. Who is in your life that you are taking to the threshold of the presence of God? Every day. That's the key thing. Every day. Maybe it's a son or daughter who's gone away from the Lord. You brought them up, knew all the Bible verses, went to Sunday school, but now they've just turned their back on it. Well, are you still picking them up every day in prayer and taking them to the threshold? Do you do it for two days and then give up? Who are you carrying? And it just shows so much love for this man that every single day can rain or sleep, probably not snow because it's very hot in Jerusalem. They will go in the morning get him dressed, get him ready, pick him up, take him. And the uh, implication there is they'd also go back in the evening, pick him up, take him home, feed him, get him into bed every single day. They loved this man so much. And actually, as we look at the early church, love is something that was really important. Christians were actually known for how they loved and carried others. People looked at them and they, they saw that they were weird. There's a Roman historian called Tacitus. I always get that name mixed up, Tacitus. And he said the Christians are a peculiar people. What does that mean? Did they dress weird? No, well, maybe some of them. Some of us dress weird, don't we? I'm not talking about socks and sandals, but I am, okay? <laughs> peculiar people. They're strange people. Why? Because they loved and this was one of the most astonishing things about the early church. People were suspicious of them because they saw they were giving so much and they were desperate to know, well, what's the string attached? But here's the thing, there was no string. They had a revelation of what Jesus had done for them and they just wanted to love in return. In fact, there was a Roman emperor called Julian. And when you say Emperor Julian, if you're a parent like me, you instantly think of Madagascar. It's not that Julian, okay? It's a proper Roman man in the fourth century. And he hated Christians. Uh, we could go into a whole deep dive of why there's whole things in his history, but we haven't got time for that. Needless to say, he wanted to get rid of Christians. It was a dominant force. It was overturning the Roman Empire, going through the empire like wildfire. And right into his generals and his leaders, he was rounding up Christians and putting them on trial, getting them to denounce Christ. And one of the things that really, really was annoying him, that people who weren't even Jewish were turning to Christ because of how they loved. He said this, so look at this word. It is disgraceful no Jew ever has to beg and the impious Christians support not only their own poor, but ours as well. All men see that our people lack aid from us. What he's saying, I'm getting really cheesed off because these people are making us look bad. It's a little bit like our government, isn't it? They're even looking after our people, not just their own. They're not just a little sect who are removing themselves. They're in our world. They're in our temples. They're in our villages. And they're looking after everyone. And of course, Christianity then started to spread like wildfire. People were like, wow, this makes a difference. And indeed, our whole Western civilization is based on Christianity. The first hospitals, universities, social care, all started with Christians. 
You see, before Christianity, if you were sick or disabled or if you were even slightly different, you weren't put in a support system with people around you to care for you. You were just left out to die. Isn't that crazy? Bonkers for us. And of course, today, atheists and agnostics say, well, we don't need faith. We don't need Christianity anymore. Not realising that their whole worldview is based on the teachings of Jesus. It's disgraceful, he said, that they don't just look after their own, but ours as well. Now, I would love this to still be the attitude of the general public today, but I don't think it is. You see, if you go out to the average Joe on the street and say, what do you think of Christians? I think it will be very far removed from this quote. And I read a quote this week. It was a meme on social media. And just as I was scrolling, it stopped me in my tracks. And, and it upset me a little bit as I thought of its implications. One sentence that actually, I think, says an awful lot about people's perceptions of who Christians are and what they do. And this was a quote. There is no hate stronger than Christian love. There is no hate stronger than Christian love. What does that mean? It means people have a perception that Christians have weaponized love to become bigots. They've rejected people in the name of love. They've hurt people in the name of love. And you know, we can so often look at this and say, well, you know, that's, that's just like, like the right-wing Christians. I think all of us, to some extent, can be guilty of this. And, 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 and sometimes I think it's an accident, but sometimes I think it's, it's really not. Gandhi said the same thing, didn't he? He said, I like your Christ, but I don't like your Christians. They are nothing like your Christ. Literally, what a paradox. The word Christian means little Christ. I like your Christ, but I don't like your Christians. And how Christians justify this is like, well, you know, we're sharing the truth. We're sharing God's word. This is what God's word said. This is what Jesus said. And I would say it like this. The right thing said in the wrong way is the wrong thing to say. The right thing said in the wrong way is the wrong thing to say. Jesus never shied away from difficult conversations and difficult truths. But didn't Jesus say, uh, it was John actually said about Jesus, didn't John say about Jesus, he came with truth and grace. Came with truth and grace. I'll treat you a little bit there because he came with grace and truth. I mixed it up on you. He came with grace and truth. And this isn't a cop out to say we should never have difficult conversations. We absolutely should. But we shouldn't hit people with the truth. We should guide them into it. <coughs> Think of Jesus at the, the well with the Samaritan woman in John 4. It's a really difficult conversation. Said, you know, you've, you've lived a dodgy life. You've had five husbands, and now the man you're living with isn't even your husband. How could that conversation have turned out if it was a pointing finger moment? How did it turn out? It turned out that Jesus had grace and truth. She went away and a whole village was saved because of it. We can have difficult conversations without damaging people. We need to say the right thing in the right way and then it's the right thing to say. We need grace and truth. And truth is being attacked left, right and centre in our world. There's some universities that say there's absolutely no truth. There's no concept of truth. Well, we believe that Jesus is the truth. We can say biblical things in a Jesus way and still have friends at the end of the day. Love isn't condemning people, it's correcting them. We don't beat people with it. The only people Jesus beat was the people who should have known better, the pastors, the Pharisees. And sometimes, if they're a pastor, if they're a Pharisee, if you need to do that to me, I can take it. Come and beat me, that's fine. But don't do it to other people, okay? This is what the Bible says about love. It says, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonour others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Amen? Amen. I put this, this up in my bathroom for Becky every morning. So when I've done something wrong, just remember, love protects, it builds up, it strengthens. Let's carry on with the story. First, uh, oh, no, let's, let's go here. Let me, let me go here. Every day. Why do we carry people every day? We carry people every day in the hopes that there's a one day. And I love this. The reason there was a one day for the man where everything changed 
because there was an every day. There's people in our lives we pick up for a couple of days and then we drop them down. Imagine if the day that Peter and John were walking past the Temple Beautiful, their friends just wanted a day off. They're like, they've got their holiday booked in Ibiza, so instead of rotating, you know, someone else to go and help him, they just left him. Who are you carrying to the thresholds of God's presence every day in the hopes that there will be a one day? A one day. Next question I want to ask you is, who are you in this account? Who are you? And I think certainly for me, whenever I read these accounts in the Bible, and I try and put myself in them, remembering that these are real accounts, they're not just fairy tales, they're real accounts that actually happens. Who do you identify with the most? Now, if you're anything like me, it's usually the hero of the story, the protagonist. So when you read it, you're probably naturally drawn to think, well, you know, I'm Peter in this story. I'm the one who, who saves the day. But actually, there are moments in our life where we're not Peter, we're the crippled man ourselves. And there are moments in all of our lives where we need to be generous enough to ourselves, not others, to admit that we need help. We need to admit ourselves that we need help. And we don't like doing this, do we? Especially in our culture. We like to have it all together to let people know that, you know, there's nothing wrong with us. We put on Instagram, uh, we've been in the gym once in a month and we're like, sixth time in the gym this week, you know, really working out. We want people to realise we have it together. And there's people in our church and conversations I've had as a pastor of nearly 12 years now, in my previous church, I'll say, where people come to the church, I've not seen them for a few weeks, and they'll say, I'm really upset because the church hasn't bothered with me. Nobody cares. No one's come to see me or speak to me. And what I found is when people come to me and say, the church, the church, or the church haven't done this and the church haven't done that, what they usually mean, but they're being nice, is Mike hasn't done that. <laughs> you haven't been to see me. You haven't been to do that. And I think it's really difficult when the perception of people's idea of the church is the pastor. That's absolutely rubbish. The pastor is not the church. We are the church. Yes. And usually you dig a little bit deeper. The church has been very involved, been calling and visiting and making meals. But, you know, I'm one man and I've only got two arms and two more at the back here. I can't do everything. The church. What we need to understand is when we're struggling, if we keep it quiet and pretend we've got it all together, people will think you've got it all together. It's a shock, isn't it? We need to make sure we put ourselves in environments. When we need help, we're going to get help. If you break your arm, do you go into a hole or the hospital? You go to the hospital. Obvious when we do that physically. But what about when that happens spiritually or emotionally? We navigate in grief. We often go to the hole instead of the hospital. See, the, the, the environments we put ourselves in are, are so important. And I bang on about my favourite verse a lot. You'll hear it in many of my sermons. Proverbs 13, 20. It says, walk with the wise and you'll become wise. A companion of fools suffers harm. What does that mean? If you're with wise people, you will naturally become wise. That is the soil you've put yourself in to grow. If you hang around with an idiot or idiots, you'll become an idiot. And that's the actual word in the Bible. I'm not cursing in the, the house of God. It's idiot. Psalm 1 says, Do not stand in the way that sinners take, nor walk with the wicked, nor sit in the seat of mockers, but delight yourself in the law of the Lord and meditate on it day and night. And the implication for that verse 3 is, Then you'll be like a tree planted by streams of living water that bears its fruit in season, and your leaf will not wither. What does that mean? If you are a tree planted by streams of living water that bear its fruit in season, you will have seasonal good times. But what it doesn't say is you'll always be fruitful. There are times when we're not always fruitful. However, if your leaf does not wither, it means you're evergreen. You'll have moments of fruitfulness, moments of goodness, and you'll also have moments of fallowness. But if your leaf is green, it means inside you're in the right environment. Mixed with difficult situations, difficult people, you'll have a difficult life. Mixed with good people and good things, you will have a good life environments are, poor, are important. So if you feel like you're on the mat this morning, don't suffer in silence. Come and see Cheryl. No, I'm only joking. <laughs> Come to us. Tell us. Let us know. We want to support you. We want to pick you up. Just like that um, Galatians 6, 2. And we talked about generosity, expecting more. In a sentence, again, this whole sermon, part two, you will always get more than what you asked for or expected when Jesus is involved, always. What are you expecting when you come to church? What do you expect? Why do you come? 
Do you come expecting a nice time of worship? You know you'll always get that at LCF, our amazing volunteers, our team. Do you expect an inspiring word? Do you expect to come and sit in the same seat every week? Isn't it annoying when someone takes your seat? (laughs) Do you expect to see people you haven't seen for a while? What do you expect? I want to tell you that God wants to exceed your expectations more and more and more. Come to church with an expectation that you will leave changed. The man came to the gate beautiful, was dropped off there to get change, and he left changed. Come with your pennies, come with your pounds spiritually, but expect to leave different and changed. Let's carry on with the story. Verse 3. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. And Peter looked straight at him. I said earlier, I imagine this is like quite an intense look. And we know from the Gospels that Peter's quite a fiery guy. Probably not the most literate, okay, like Paul later, who was a Pharisee himself, or Luke, who was a doctor. So I imagine as Peter looked at this man, he would have got a bit worried, because I imagine it would have looked painful for Peter to think. I believe he was thinking, what do I give this man? So Peter said, look at us. And the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, MasterCard or Visa, I do not have. But what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. And we all know where this sermon's going. If you've been in church for any length of time, you know what is coming. You see, so often when people ask us for something, we just say, well, sorry, I haven't got anything. But we all have something. We all have something. We all have a gift that is given by God. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 8 says, each of you has been given a manifestation of the Spirit, a gift to what? To serve others. 1 Peter 4.10 says exactly the same thing that Peter will read about in the story. Each of you has been given a gift from the manifestation of the one spirit. 1 Corinthians 12.5-8 to says the same thing. Each and every one of us has a gift. Very, very often we see a need and say, sorry, I don't have anything. Quick example, this week I had an email land in my inbox. We had this prayer and praise newsletter that uh, Ray Summers, our prayer leader, Leads And I saw this report come in from the prayer and praise newsletter. And uh, she won't mind me saying this. I know she'll be watching online. Gwyneth, lady in our church, 84 years old. And she sent this long email. She said, I'm so happy to hear that Hezekiah is leading our students, uh, our post-grad community. She said, I would love to serve, but I just haven't got the ability to anymore. So what she says, I haven't got. She says, but what I have got and what I can do is pray for them. Would that be okay? Isn't that amazing? 84 years old, still serving the kingdom, still building the body. Can't come in person to the student group with Hezekiah and Favour and the guys, but what she can do, she can pray. And that puts us to shame sometimes, isn't it? An 84-year-old woman, she's paid her dues, she's done her time in church. I haven't got this, but what I have got, I give to you. This is what discipleship is. Taking what God has given us, taking in what is placed in our hands and employing it for the kingdom. And the church, we have all these sort of discipleship courses. We run some brilliant courses at LCF. And indeed around Christendom, there's all these discipleship courses. Eight sessions here and 10 sessions here and a thousand pounds for this discipleship course and, and come for three months on this discipleship course. And I'm going to do you a favour and save you a lot of time and money. Discipleship, every discipleship course, if it's a proper discipleship course, can be summed up in one sentence. And it's this. Do what Jesus would do if he were you. That's it. Don't need eight sessions, 10 sessions, 15 sessions. All you need to do, if you want to be a disciple of Jesus, a Christian, a little Christ, is do what Jesus would do if he were you. And I think as Peter was looking at this man and thinking with his face screwed up, looking in pain, I think what he was doing is like, I haven't got any money, haven't got any cards, haven't got any food, there's nothing I can give. What would Jesus do in this situation if he were me? And what did he do? He did what Jesus would do. Get up and walk. And as you go about your workplace and your homes and your relationship groups, your friends, your family, and there's an instance where there's a need presented, ask yourself that question. What would Jesus do if he were me? 
And I think the reason we get so pent up about using our gifts and putting ourselves out there is we don't want to be embarrassed. But what if I, if I step out and I look stupid or silly or shy? You know, what, what if I can't follow through in what Jesus wants me to do? A little bit like what Wendy said last week, do you remember going into Starbucks with a homeless man and he ran off? Like, I'd die in that situation. I'm so socially awkward, I'd go bright red and pass out. Okay, it's awkward, awful. But here's the thing. Take the pressure off yourself because your gift isn't about you. Although the gift came through Peter, it wasn't from Peter. And we see this amazing faith of Peter here. He's like, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. We see it's a bold statement. What I think he's doing, he's actually putting a caveat in there. If this doesn't work, it's not my fault. So it's not in the name of Peter, get up and walk. It's in the name of Jesus. And what I love about Peter is he doesn't do it quietly. Now, got to tell the truth because I'm in church. If this was me, what I'd do, I'd probably look around and then I'd probably whisper in the man's ear, can I pray for you? And then I'd pray in my mind and, and I'd say to him, do you feel anything different? And if he says no, I say, oh, don't worry, I'll come back tomorrow with a tenner, okay? But Peter didn't do that. What he did is he told him to get up and walk before he got up. Isn't that amazing? He told him to walk before anything happened. What I do have, I give to you. He told him what it was going to give him. It was a miraculous thing. And then the man actually did it. And I think so often we get stuck way back here. We don't have the faith to carry through. But here's what you need to remember. It's not about you. It doesn't come from you. You're not powerful. You're not supernatural. You're not miraculous. The only reason you can be is because we're empowered by the Holy Spirit in us that comes through us. And when we start moving in faith, we start to speak in the language of heaven. Faith is the language of heaven. God will do as we do. It's not because He can't do it before we say anything. He wants us to grow and mature and walk in His ways. There's one translation of this story I love. Peter looks at the man and he says, look, I don't have anything, but I want you to get up and walk. And it says, as Peter grabbed his hand and pulled him up, it says, as he pulled him up, the man was healed. In the NIV, it says instantly. He pulled him up and instantly he was healed. It was only as Peter committed to do something that the miracle happened. And so often we say, well, I haven't seen any miracles. I haven't been able to walk in any of that. The reason is because we haven't begun the process. We haven't done. My challenge for you this week is look for instances. Instances that scare you, that put you in a faith zone. I've said it before, we like to stay in our comfort zones because we think they're safe. But comfort zones don't keep us safe. They just keep us small. God wants us to step out and walk in His ways with a generous spirit. You might not have tons of money, might not have gold or silver, might not have any glory, no one knows your name, but what you do have is the power of God working within you and He wants to work through you. So I wonder as we stand, please let me pray for you. We're running out of time a little bit, so I'll make this really, really short and sweet. There's three things I want to pray for. The first one, I want you to walk away from today with that question ringing in your ears. Who are we carrying every day in the hopes that there will be a one day? It's a prodigal son or daughter, a friend, an auntie, a work colleague. Who are we carrying every day in the hope that there's a one day? Number two, in what ways can we extend generosity? By that, I mean exceeding expectations. How can we exceed expectations this week in people's lives around us? And number three, are we that person who just needs to be bold enough and courageous enough to be vulnerable, to invite people into our journey where we say, look, I need a helping hand. I'm really struggling. Can you help carry me to the threshold of God's presence? So let's worship as we mull on those three questions. Thanks, Lord.
what the mercy of God can do. If you knew me then, you believe me now, turn my whole life upside down. Took the old and he made it new. It's just what the mercy of God can do. Oh, 
hallelujah. There is power in the blood. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. As I close, I just want to remind you, if you're new here, the um, new here bags that you can collect at reception. Um, for anyone who is interested to know more about gifted, there's the leaflets at the front, and also you can speak to Ian. Let's just pray. Father God, we know that there is power in the blood. We know, oh God, that you, that you sent Jesus and he's done it all for us on Calvary. Father God, as we go this afternoon, we ask that you go with us. Be with us, oh God. Father God, use us, oh God. As Mike said, Father God, Lord, let us step out a bit out of our comfort zone this week that we will be used by you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a blessed day. Amen.